This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Okay, welcome to This Week in Virology. This is episode 185. Today's May 24th, 2012. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Today we're in Chicago, Illinois, back for the second time in a year, and we are recording at Northwestern University School of Medicine in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And uh, joining me today are members of the department, starting on my left, not that anyone has video and can see anything, from Evanston, the Evanston campus, someone I've wanted to have on the show for a long time, Robert Lamb. You gonna say anything? I say hello, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> You're so loquacious usually. <laughs> Put a microphone in front of you there. Yeah, it really does start. Thing, does it? Thanks, I appreciate your joining us, driving all the way from Evanston. Oh, it's all the 12 miles, it's a long way. Thanks for very much for joining us. To his left, also, from Northwestern, but this campus, which is the medical school, uh, also in microbiology and immunology, Gregory Smith. Thanks for having me, and I'm sure you appreciate me walking across the street. To yeah, get here. that was a tough one, I know. <laughs> I did that a few times today. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, to Greg's left, a student in the MD PhD program here and a member of the Longnecker Lab, Andrew Caraba. Welcome. Thanks, Vince. Glad did to be I, on the show. Did I say Caraba correctly? That is there correct. There are many ways you could pronounce that. Uh, but we pronounce it Caraba. Caraba. Very good. Thanks for joining us today. And finally, all the way on the end, also a postdoc in the Long Necker Lab, Sarah Connolly. Hi. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for joining us. And I think you were the first person who invited me here over a year ago to do this. Yeah, we had a vote. The students and postdocs voted on who they wanted to come in to give a seminar. And I nominated you and you won. So hence. I won. One by one vote. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for uh, voting for me. So I was originally invited to give a talk. And then I think you said, or someone said, you want to do a TWIV. Absolutely. Well, you're here. So this is often what happens. I get invited to give a seminar, and then people say, do you want to do a TWIV? Because TWIV has penetrated many places now, as you know. A lot of people know about it. It's a great opportunity to get some of the local people together and chat. And every one of these people have said to me, what are we going to talk about? And I didn't tell them. So it's all a surprise. In fact, I don't even know. So I hope you have something good in mind. Now, we have plenty to talk about. First, I want to explore each of your pasts, because our listeners like to hear where you came from, and how you got to where you are today. Vin, shouldn't we first uh, talk about the weather? Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Andrew, what's the weather today here? Uh, It's bright and sunny and hot in Chicago. It's uh, 84 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 28.89 degrees Celsius. Thank you. It is a beautiful day out here. It's just gorgeous. No clouds in the sky. It's warm, and it's very pleasant to be outside. I was standing outside the hotel just basking in the sun this morning, and guy said, you need a cab? I said, no, <laughs> I'm just getting the sun. Okay, let's start with you, Bob Lamb. I've known you for many years. Yeah. I have known you since I was a graduate student with Peter Palazzi, which would be between um, 75 and 79. So I was a graduate student in Cambridge in England from 71 to 74, and then came to the Rockefeller University in New York City to work with Pernal Chopin, who was a virologist who worked on influenza viruses and paramyxoviruses. He was a physician by training, uh, but he'd gone into basic research, and he was the professor at Rockefeller in virology. I stayed there until uh, December of 1982, first as a postdoc and then as an assistant professor and finally as an associate professor. Then I moved to Northwestern University in Evanston, where I've been uh, ever since. Do you remember when I first met you? Absolutely. And uh, I remember being on your thesis committee. (laughs) (laughs) You were on my um, qualifying exam. I was on your qualifying exam. and I was on your thesis uh, as well? Yeah, I was on your... All right. So, So, you know, back then it was hard to find virologists in New York City. So 
Peter said, we have to get Bob to do this. So I remember one of the questions you asked me on my qualifying exam, which stumped me. I couldn't answer it. Do you remember what it was? No, but it's probably something to do with SDS gels. <laughs> no, no, not quite, but it had to do with Maxim and Gilbert sequencing. Oh, uh, okay. So does anyone know what Maxim and Gilbert sequencing is, by the way? You do, Richard does. So I, might, I should say we have a nice audience here, people from the department. I don't know, 50 people, I would say, are in this room, right? So thanks for coming. Maxim and Gilbert sequencing. Uh, you take a piece of DNA and you, you kinase both ends with isotopic P32 and then you have to cut it in half to separate the two pieces so you can do sequencing, chemical sequencing. And you asked me, when you do maximum Gilbert sequencing, what is the one requirement? And I didn't have any clue. What you, it was too general. So let me ask you, do you know what the one requirement is? <laughs> <laughs> Probably you have single end labeled DNA. Yeah, and how do you do that? You have to separate the two fragments or strands separate. That's exactly it. You have, to be able to, you have to have a restriction site which cuts or you can strand separate the double-stranded DNA yeah. by alkali denaturation. Yeah, that was too hard back then. So that was the but question. I think the yeah. very important thing about, nobody knows what Maxim Gilbert's sequencing is today, because it was pretty quickly, although he got the, Gilbert got the Nobel Prize for it, and he shared that Nobel Prize with uh, Fred Sanger. So it's, Fred Sanger had developed a method that was more akin to what's done today, which was dideoxy sequencing, which is chain terminating sequencing by putting in di dideoxys. And the most important thing for both methods was you had a gel system that could separate DNA by one base pair by one base pair and so on and so forth. So you, you formed a ladder. But the very interesting thing out of Maxim Gilbert sequencing was this, in fact, it had a high degree of technical ability to be able to do it well. And you could actually tell which graduate students were really going to be good or not by whether, in fact, they could run four or 500 nucleotides off, off on the gel. And those who got gels that looked by shambles could never do anything else quite right. And those who could get beautiful gels could do everything right. Now, I don't know what that is to this day that you could teach people. There was something magic. Some people, some students got it and some didn't. And I think it's all to do with the care and attention you had to pay. You had to make, take a remarkable amount of care about how you actually did the chemical fragmentation. Uh, or the reactions were very sensitive to doing things wrong and leaving little traces of chemical left over. But you know, today it's sort of farcical in a way in that regard because nobody even has to know what, what dideoxy sequencing is. It's, uh, DNA is that stuff you send off to a facility and overnight comes back on the internet your results with the sequence and you don't pay any attention to how it's derived. You don't even know if the machine made errors because nobody, nobody checks anymore. So we don't do it ourselves, but is there an equivalent technique that separates the good students from the not so good students these days? I don't, I don't think I've found anything as revealing as sequencing. Sequencing, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think you would have ever taken me on as a student because I didn't, never done Max and Gilbert, but when I did Sanger, we used to have to transfer that gel off the glass plate onto Wattman, and I can't, I can't count how many times I yelled obscenities in the lab when that thing tore in that process. Yeah, so we would take, you would have these big glass, we're reminiscing here, big glass <laughs> sheets, and you'd open them and there's this thin polyacrylamide gel, and then you had to put a, a used piece of x-ray film and peel it up. You used x-ray film to peel it? Yeah, what'd you use, Wattman or something? Yeah, Wattman. Wattman. So we used x-ray film, you'd peel it up, and you'd wrap it in saran and put it in the freezer with, a, with another piece of film and a, a, one of those intensifying screens. Uh, but that was the crucial part, mm -hmm. getting that. They're all hedged right there. Yeah. Yeah. It was no, I still think actually the most difficult part was loading those gels because you had a 0.15 millimeter uh, spacer and comb and you had to use a drawn out capillary to load the gel and you had to load it over probably four centimeters or so. And so if your hand shook, if you drank a cup of coffee before you loaded yeah, your right. gel, snap, snap and your sample was gone. Yeah, and now you had to draw those out yourself. Those, you, you would make them. a collection for your gel, you'd put them in a little beaker. And Nowadays you can buy tips, I think, that fit you can. into these things. Okay. But I mean, I've still got the combs that I made by hand yeah. out of that special plastic. <laughs> and somebody put them in a, in a frame and gave them to me. <laughs> yeah, that's great, that's great. It's in your office? It's in my office. I have no idea who put it in the frame. It was a student, but I can't remember who it was. All right. I have to, I'm going to ask you to send a picture of that, because I think that. I threw away all my gels, so as a postdoc, I sequenced polio by hand by uh, Maxim and Gilbert. And I had all the gels in 
five or six boxes, big, you know, those big films. And in about five years ago, I figured I'm never going to need these. I threw them away. And I would love to have just one of those nice gels now. I've kept two. Yeah, yeah. beautiful ones. The, anyway. the one that proved there was overlapping reading frames in influenza virus, <laughs> and the one, in fact, that showed there was splicing of influenza virus. They're the only two x-ray That's films That's a good I idea have. that you kept that. Because they were the, the key pieces of data that made important papers. So you, you think this is crazy that we're reminiscing, but in 10 years, you're going to say, you remember when we used to put DNA in these machines and put the temperature up and down? And you're going you're gonna to laugh about that because techniques go by the wayside. You know, it's just amazing. And that's what makes science go forward. Um, Greg, I know that you were in Lynn Enquist's lab because he and I wrote a textbook. We see each other. Did we ever meet in the lab or? You know, I, I think we, well, we never met in the lab. But I think we might have met, although I'm not sure. One time I was at a conference, I was a graduate student at the time, and uh, I can't remember if it was a Gordon, Gordon or a FASM meeting, but I was getting a little exhausted from all the science discussion, and, and so I left the conference room briefly and just took a, got some fresh air and took a little bit of a walk. And before coming back, somebody drove up in a convertible sports car and then came right up to me, I was the only person around saying, where's the conference room, where's the conference room? And I have this, I think it was you. I don't have a convertible. <laughs> Do you ever drive a fancy convertible sports car? No, I wish I did. I don't no? know. No? Right. It's, it's a very idealized uh, image. Oh, you've burst my bubble. Doesn't mean, so right. I didn't mean. So I, used, I, te I uh, teach in his course, and I would have lunch with the TAs, but you never did that with me. You weren't, I guess you probably started that after, after I had left. left. Yeah. So uh, that's what I know about you and here. So where were you before your postdoc with Lynn? That was Lynn Enquist at Princeton. That's right, and that's where I started working on virology and herpes viruses. But uh, before that, I was working on uh, bacterial pathogen, Listeria monocytogenes, and that was with Daniel Portnoy, who at the time was at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, I remember that. And did, where are you from originally? Well, actually, I was born in Elmhurst, just not far, close, from, not far from here, but my family moved to Southern California before I turned one, so I don't have any memories of Illinois prior to coming here for... And where'd you go to college? Uh, UC Santa Barbara, and then uh, UPenn, and then Princeton. So I have a Dan Portnoy story. Who doesn't? <laughs> Anybody know Dan Portnoy or heard of him? So I roomed with him at a meeting in Switzerland once. Mm -hmm. And um, so after the conference was over at 11 o'clock or whatever, we'd go back to the room and I'd, you know, we'd climb into our beds and he talked for hours and hours. He wouldn't go to sleep. You know, I'd be really quiet lying there. He just, <laughs> that's, my, that's my image of Dan Portnoy. And so here, uh, this was your first job out of your postdoc. That's coming, right. From came came yeah, straight here in end of 2001. Okay. Uh, Andrew, you're an MD-PhD student uh, with Richard Longnecker. How did you end up here? Um, so I grew up in the Chicago suburbs in a small town called Clarendon Hills and then went to Northwestern uh, for undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate degree up on the Evanston campus. And I uh, majored um, in a program there called the Integrated Science Program. And it's sort of a uh, honors science curriculum where you do a lot of physics, a lot of math, a little bit of biology, a little bit of chemistry, and decided after that that um, I really wanted to pursue research, but also um, was really fascinated by uh, sort of the clinical application of, of science and biological uh, research. So I uh, looked into the MD-PhD program. It was actually my aunt who first told me that there were such things as MD-PhD programs. So I applied to several and decided uh, to continue my training here at uh, Northwestern on the Chicago campus in the MSTP. And I did my first two years of clinical training, or preclinical training. So the first two years of medical school are largely classroom-based. Uh, and then joined uh, Richard Longnecker's lab. And I've been there uh, since 2000 in the summer of 2009, working on uh, herpes virus entry in a mouse model. So your aunt uh, gave you advice about what to do? Yeah, right? she, uh, she is a, she uh, a physician. physician. Yeah, she's okay. a, a pediatrician, and she uh, spent most of her career at Johns Hopkins um, in uh, the uh, Department of Pediatrics. And she knew I was interested in research, but also had uh, an inkling for, for clinical work and uh, suggested that uh, the MD-PhD program would be a good way to combine those, uh, those two interests. I noticed you, uh, you wrote a little blog for a while. I discovered it. I, I did. I started writing it in the, when I uh, first started uh, medical school, but uh, kind of uh, petered out as classes got more intense and uh, my interest uh, went to other things. So we've had a few MD-PhD scientists on TWIV, but never uh, one in training. 
So can you sum it up? What's it like? Is, is it good for everyone or, or very few people? What do you think? So uh, it's definitely a long haul. Uh, at the very minimum, if you're very good and lucky, it'll take you probably seven years to do the MD and the PhD. Uh, it's certainly not for everyone. If you have no interest in ever seeing a patient, I don't think that you should go to medical school. Uh, you should probably just uh, um, go ahead and, and do a PhD. Uh, but the, I think it is right for people that know they want to, to do both, to have some part of their career seeing patients and also, uh, also doing research. Um, obviously, there are many successful researchers that have uh, MDs and do not have PhDs. Uh, and those people, at some point in their career, had to learn how to do research. And I thought that since I knew I wanted to do research, it would be good to do a PhD and learn and have that, that sort of intensive research training uh, early in my career as opposed to uh, later on. So right now you're in the part of the program that you're doing lab work, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So you've done two years of coursework? Yep, I've done uh, M1 and M2 year, as we call them here, and then um, this is my third year of uh, graduate work. He works on flu proteins, M1 and M2. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> trying to wake him up. <laughs> so um, it will be interesting to have you back when you're at a different stage in your training and see what you think. Yeah. Because we, now we caught you early on. We have a T0 and uh, we can catch you later. So Sarah, tell us uh, your history. Well, I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and uh, majored in microbiology. And it was a great place to be because there was a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for research. So I started research in labs there my freshman year and was able to continue through my senior year in a few, couple different labs um, and was able to go to University of Texas as well as Lawrence Livermore National Lab to get some breadth of research experience and decided I wanted to get a PhD. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania um, in their cell and molecular biology program. Um, I, at the time, was interested in gene therapy um, but was wisely advised to just learn some virology first before learning the application of virology. And then I just stuck with virology. So I was in the lab of Gary Cohn and Roz Eisenberg, who study herpes simplex virus entry. And I studied how the virus binds to cellular receptors um, to trigger entry. After that, after my PhD, I came to my hometown, Chicago, and joined the lab of Bob Lamb, who's here with us, um, to continue studying virus entry uh, this time I switched into paramyxoviruses, so viruses related to measles and mumps. And instead of studying the receptor binding, I studied the fusion, the protein that uh, executes fusion of the viral envelope with the host cell. And while I was in Bob's lab, there were some advancements made in herpes virus entry. Some crystal structures of the fusion protein were solved. Um, and so I came to the medical school campus and I joined the lab of Richard Longnecker, where I am now doing a second postdoc um, to study the fusion protein of herpes simplex virus. So what's next for you? Oh, and I have just accepted a new job. Um, in the fall, I'll be starting as an assistant professor at DePaul University in Chicago, um, where I will be uh, teaching as well as have a research lab where I will mainly have undergraduate and master's students in the lab, again, studying herpes simplex virus entry. Great. So it's interesting that you followed this very similar path of studying virus entry at every stage PhD, post, two postdocs, this, most people don't do that, right? I'd probably have to blame Gary and Roz, uh, my ed, um, PhD advisors, because they were fantastic. I don't think you could find anybody better. And um, they sort of made me fall in love with the topic, I imagine. And that's why I'm still doing it. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's just unusual that you, you would train in all similar areas. I don't see it very often. Not that it's bad, not, not at all. So Bob, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. I want to talk a little bit about what you do, um, fusion of paramyxoviruses or entry of paramyxoviruses. But before we do that, as you know, uh, recently there has been a controversy over influenza H5H, uh, H5N1 publication. And one of the papers involved, the Kawaoka paper, was published a few years ago. Sorry, a few, days uh, ago. few weeks ago. <laughs> days, weeks. And in that paper, the mutations were revealed um, that allowed air, airborne transmission of a reassortant virus with the H5 of H5N1 and then the rest of the genome from, from pandemic H1N1. 
And what he found, and this is what I want your opinion on, so if you, if you introduce mutations in the HA to allow it to bind um, mammalian sialic acid linkages, alpha-2,6, right? Mm -hmm. In the ferret, then, you select for additional mutations both in the head of the HA and near the fusion peptide, which he found restored the low pH stability of, of the protein. So do, does this make sense to you? Can you explain why this happened? Well, <clears throat> the extra residue, I mean, first of all, he, he made a virus by reverse genetics that had two mutations that were fully predicted to be capable of binding to alpha-2,6 uh, silic acid. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was pretty obvious and been known for a long period of time. And he put that virus into a ferret. And to start with, it, it hardly grew at all. But then he actually he selected a virus that now had a third mutation that's related to the silic acid binding site. And so that hadn't been, been seen a great deal before, though it's present in some natural isolates. Uh, and it makes sense. But the fourth mutation that he found, which again was by serial passaging the virus from the previous ferret into the next ferret, uh, is to do with the stability of the hemagglutinin. And it appears that if you have a hemagglutinin that undergoes its pH of transition to the low pH form above about 5.8, it's a pretty unstable hemagglutinin for other reasons. If it's too low, below 5.2, again, it's an unstable hemagglutinin. So what he's found is, is the residue, I think it was residue 310, uh, that's related to, to the... Um, major refolding event in the hemagglutinin that adds stability to that hemagglutinin. It lowers the pH optima towards 5.6. And he's found that. And my real question's been, I believe the data that he has is absolutely fine. The question is, if you do the experiment again, would you automatically find that mutation or not? That is, how common an occurrence is that particular one uh, going to be? Um, you know, in part, he's done an experiment that's part synthetic that is, made a revert, used his brains of what we know in the literature to make a virus by reverse genetics, where he gets two mutations, and then he gets the other two just by serial passage. Um, so, in a way, that's the sort of repeat of what was done in uh, 1933, when Wilson Smith, who was working with Christ Christopher Andrews, uh, took a virus from a human and called the virus D Wilson Smith after himself, WS, and then he wanted to have a mouse model for the virus because he wanted a small animal model, although flu is not a natural pathogen of mice. It still can be used as a small, mo as a small animal model to a certain, certain extent. And what they did was, was they decided, well, we know from the old polio literature from years ago that what you do is you inoculate the mouse brain with the influenza virus. And that's what they did. And they serially took virus out of mouse brain, put it into the next mouse brain, and serial passaged it down and down the line. And after 10 passages, they got a virus out that was highly neurotropic for the mouse, killed the mouse. And that's the virus that's been used ever since in the laboratory because, in fact, it can kill a mouse and you get an endpoint to your experiments. And that virus is called Wilson-Smith neurotropic, otherwise known as WSN. So in a way, this whole business that Kawioka has done is he's repeated a very old, time-honored type of method, except this time he's done it in a ferret. And so has Fouché done exactly the same thing in a ferret, uh, as far as we can understand, although that paper's not yet been released. So you don't know the, if the Fouché mutations are the same as the Kawioka? I'm told two of them at least overlap, because they both started off by doing reverse genetics. To allow well, I have binding I, to I've seen yeah. for months, I've seen the Kawioka paper, but I haven't seen the Fouché one. So th does it make sense that this uh, amino acid change near the fusion peptide would change the, the pH trigger for fusion? That's a very difficult question to answer because it's not an obvious residue. Like it's not a histidine uh, or something of that sort where we know that they're the pro residues that become protonated. Um, you know, having been told afterwards that it makes these changes and he provides data to show there's a change in the pH optima and there's a pH, is an increase in stability of that hemagglutinin uh, by heating. Uh, it makes some sense, but that's, it's retrospective looking. You, can't, you wouldn't have been able to predict it from the structure in the first place. So in, in, a, in this way, these experiments are useful because they provide something new that we didn't expect. And remember, there was a call to restrict their publication 
which now looking at the data would have been silly, right? Because this is good information that we want out there that people can discuss and, and interpret. Well, I think that the whole idea of you know, delaying or banning their publication uh, in a way was a little misguided because of what I've just said about serially passaging viruses in an animal. I mean, the so-called dual use and the bioterrorist who was going to go off and make those specific mutations and make a virus that, what, that in fact is the Andromeda strain. It really, I think, is misplaced because if you wanted to do such a thing, you don't want to learn reverse genetics of influenza virus and make specific mutations that in your particular background, strain background, might not work anyway. Just serially passage the virus in ferrets. I mean, they were trying to close the barn door. Long, the horse had gone. You don't close the barn door once the horse is gone. So... I think you might get banned for saying this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> banned from uh, what? Banned for saying that. You don't, want, you don't want the terrorists to know that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I think, that, I think they're smart enough to have figured that out long ago. Uh, I really do. Well, I, I just think that these... Uh, I, I remember the New York Times uh, published an ed editorial back in January saying this work should never have been done. But, of course, they hadn't read the paper. And they were just thinking in terms of risk. But I think one of the big disconnects in this and where things went radically wrong and off the rails, because this all started last September uh, when Fouchier gave a presentation at the meeting I was not at in Malta, but quite a lot of people were at. And he is quoted, at least by Iserink, as saying, this was the most stupid experiment I could have ever done. I mean, he created his own problem. But at the end of the day, I think that even though he was in the press every week from October through about a week ago, uh, nature and science lapped it up because they were pushing it for their sales to write stories about this all the time. I think where it had gone wrong was Kabioka in a way was smart not to talk to the press while this was going on. But I think he could have clarified one thing. The public was left with the generalized impression that this was a killer virus and all the ferrets died. And that's what was repeated over and over again in editorials from the New York Times to the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, the ferrets didn't die. None of Carioca's ferrets died. In fact, they were less sick than they would have been if, if, in fact, inoculated with the pandemic 2009 virus. Somewhere along this time, Carioca could have stopped the rampant press speculation by coming out and saying, my ferrets didn't die. Now, Fouché has, has a slightly different problem because he absolutely, I think, left people with the impression that all his ferrets were dead. At least he did in Malta. And he had, reminds me of that old Monty Python skit where, in fact, they talked about the dead parrot. And there's one shop owner, there's one person complaining he's just bought a parrot from the sh pet shop owner and this parrot is dead as you whack the thing onto the countertop. <laughs> And the, and the shop owner says, no, 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 this parrot's just resting. It's just resting. And he goes, I know a dead parrot when I see one. I know a dead parrot. Well, the problem is, is Fouché really, does he know the difference between a live or a dead ferret? <laughs> because if you'd ever seen a ferret, you would know that they're as vicious as squirrels. Okay, there's a few people who have a pet, who, who have a pet ferret. But you've got to be very, very careful. Because a squirrel, which they're very similar to in nature, is a very vicious animal. And you could lose your fingers for good with it. <laughs> so you could be super careful. So, you know, I worry about the difference between the live and the dead ferret. In reality, his ferrets all lived. The bottom line was, and if he come out and said that weeks and weeks and weeks ago, don't panic, we haven't created the Andromeda strain. We've done a piece of basic science. We've shown what might be important for transmissibility. I think that, in fact, we wouldn't have had this enormous press hype about it. Well, I, I think part of his response to you would be that shortly after he said that, the NSABB told him he couldn't talk about anything anymore referring with respect to the paper, so he just shut up. And it wasn't until about a month ago that he did tell us that it was Yeah, but the reasonable. NSABB actually has no powers whatsoever. It can make recommendations, but it doesn't have any legal authority. They, if he'd chosen to say something, they, they couldn't have done anything to him. They don't, have, uh, they don't really have any status in, in the eyes of the law. Right. It's a good lesson. Uh, not, not all of us deal with these kinds of issues. And um, this is a good litmus test for 
how things may go if you're working on particular viruses oh, or I other th I, I think that we are going to see some major changes brought about. Yeah. I think this will have a very negative effect on what you can do and what you can't do. I mean, already the NIH is screening everything for dual use. And uh, I think it's going to have uh, some serious repercussions. And did anyone else on the panel uh, pay much attention to this story? you have any opinions about it? Greg, did you? Well, not too much, but it does sound like, I mean, so this, of course, relates to the previous story of the 1918 pandemic flu and, and the controversy that brought up when it was, the sequence was published. It sounds like you probably actually say that was probably more controversial than the current H5N1 is because, as you pointed out, with H5N1, you can just make it yourself, just get some ferrets, live or dead, do the experiment. <laughs> But with the uh, 1918, you can't do, there is an experiment to do. So the information was somewhat novel and can, can only be acquired through that, that resource, is that right? And there is no doubt that the 1918 sequence, in fact, leads to a highly, highly pathogenic virus. Well, one of the members of the NSAVB has actually said he regrets approving publication of that 1918 sequence. But it's done, and I understand now if you have been infected with 2009 H1N1, you have some you protection. have protection against yeah. 1918. So that its value as a bioterror agent is gone, essentially. Andrew, thoughts? I, well, I, I agreed with, um, yeah, I listened to uh, the previous episodes of TWIV where, where you guys discussed it, and I agreed with the point that you guys were making about, um, you know, once the research is already completed, the publication step is, I mean, obviously more people can read it once it's published, but the whole research was conducted under non-secure conditions anyway, so it's not it's not like restricting the publication is going to really stop the dissemination of the information if it, if it really needed to, if, if it really wanted to get right. out. Right. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, it just doesn't seem like, it seems like there should be more organization and more um, analysis prior to conducting the research. Yeah, I think that's going to happen now, but I think they'll, so I got involved in this. I don't work on influenza any longer, and uh, but I thought it was important for the other side, which is, every, I think everything should be published. I can't think of any research, bona fide scientific research that shouldn't be published, unless you're trying to make a bioweapon on purpose. I don't think you should censor it. I think the way science works is to publish. And uh, not, not everyone feels that way, but I think that that voice has to be heard. So uh, a lot of people were surprised that I was talking about it because I don't work on it, but I think it's important. And maybe that's another message. You know, If you have an opinion on something, you should talk out about it because you're the scientists and who knows better than, than you do. So I've been seeing a couple of reports in various different settings of people putting virulence determinants from one pathogen into another. And it reminded me a little bit of work that you presented today where you took 2A two, two protease out of polio and put it into a different coronavirus. And if, in that case, you're putting it into a mouse virus. I don't think we're going to be too concerned about what it does to us. But I mean, how do you feel about those kinds of experiments? Do you think that those things should be more highly regulated, or is it just fine to go ahead and, and just hope that the Andromeda strain isn't the next thing around the corner? So uh, I've been thinking about lab manipulating viruses for a long time, because we did it with polio a long time ago. And I just think that the modifications we make in most cases att attenuate or have a fitness cost for the organism, so they're not likely to become pathogens. I don't think you can ever rule against it. Um, but I do think, you, so in some cases, you have to do the experiments under proper containment. That's clear. Uh, and then you should publish it because I don't think any information of that sort is, is useful. I think the idea that terrorists will use bioweapons is probably just bluffing and it wants to get us to spend a lot of time and money doing anti-bioterror work and spending money. It's sort of like the Star Wars approach of Ronald Reagan for the old Soviet Union. So I think that it's, uh, I think we should publish everything, including those kinds of experiments you talk about. That's the way science works, and I really, I really feel strongly about it. Um, okay, now Bob, I wanted to ask you, so this, this, the H5 virus gets into cells by a low pH mediated fusion um, mechanism, right? Correct. Now your lab for many years has worked on the paramixo model, which is not low e pH mediated. And I just, we've never talked about this on TWIV, so I wondered if you could just explain how that works and what your structures tell us about it. Well, the viruses that don't use low pH would appear to use, and that's of course is, is the paramyxovirus family, which is a very large and ubiquitous family of viruses. The, we, for many herpes viruses in the right cell type, will work at uh, neutral pH. 
and then, of course, many retroviruses, including HIV. You'll always find, though, a cell type in which, in fact, the virus gets internalized. The big key question to always ask is, is this, in fact, through the use of low uh, pH or not? That is, do you need to take an acid bath to get uncoated? That's the key determinant. It doesn't matter whether a virus that normally fuses at the plasma membrane can go in by some form of endocytosis and then can, in fact, enter the cytoplasm. It's a, the key question is, does it need the low pH environment found uh, in the uh, endosomal pathway? So the viruses we've worked with cause fusion, at least we believe, at the plasma membrane, but certainly at neutral pH. And they all require receptor binding. Now, some viruses, such as the HIV envelope glycoprotein, has both receptor binding capabilities and also fusion activity, whereas the paramyx of viruses appear to need the expression of both of their receptor binding protein and their fusion protein in the same cell. And you can't mix and match the receptor binding proteins with the fusion protein. And there is quite a body of evidence that says that the receptor binding protein that's invariably called HNH or G uh, in, indeed interacts physically with the fusion protein. You can co-IP the, the two proteins in some people's hands. Uh, in certain cases, they will cap and co-patch uh, on cells. And there's quite a lot of indirect experiments from mutagenesis to suggest, in fact, it's the so-called stalk of the hemagglutinin neuraminidase, or H or G protein, uh, that indeed uh, is the part of the protein on H or G or HN that interacts with F. And so that's fairly clear that those two proteins, I think, interact. Now, the structures have been obtained of quite a large number of the receptor binding proteins. And the receptor binding proteins are broken down by these names, HN, H, or G, depending on what the, the receptor is. If it's HN, it's silic acid is the receptor that can be present on glycolipid or on other carbohydrate chains. H is reserved for measles virus, and that has a proteinaceous receptor. In fact, it has more than one, CD46, CD150, SLAM, and then a, 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 another molecule. It's a nectin-4 molecule. Uh, Hendra and Niper virus use very specific Efrin B2 or Efrin B3 proteinaceous receptors. But the receptor binding proteins themselves, of which several crystal structures have now been obtained, are structurally all very similar. They all have the so-called blades of a propeller type structure. And so those that lack uh, neuraminidase activity simply have got a dead active site. Uh, it's, uh, it's as simple as, as that. Uh, the sites where the proteinaceous receptors bind are known. There's co-crystal structures of that. It's usually on the side of the molecule, on the head of the molecule, as you might, might expect. But the big unanswered question, this is in fact how you convert the metastable fusion protein uh, into one that becomes a, basically a nanomachine that has to undergo a series of protein refolding events to end up in a very stable form and going from the metastable form to the stable uh, post-fusion form uh, involves, in fact, is the work that the protein does to bring about membrane merger. It's anchored in the viral membrane, it intercalates into the target membrane, and then it pull, literally pulls those two membranes together to enable various lipidic events to happen to let the membrane proteins fuse. So their structures, of, there's only one pre-fusion structure uh, at the present time from parainfluenza virus 5. There's several post-fusion structures uh, from Newcastle disease virus, uh, parainfluenza virus uh, 3, and uh, now Niper virus. And uh, they're all very, very similar in terms of uh, their structure in the post-fusion form. So is it true, is it the case that the fusion peptide is typically buried near the membrane in the pre-fusion form? No, it's not particularly in the membrane. It's actually about two-thirds of the way up the molecule. Uh, and uh, it, it is partially... It is not like the flu hemagglutinin, where we know where it's buried. Uh, it is partially solvent exposed, and it's partially buried. And on cleavage, which we've recently determined, uh, the, the structure of the cleave def protein, there's really only this very small change. Uh, the two, it becomes two frayed ends that are still external to the molecule. 
Uh, so it's a very different paradigm from that of the flu hemagglutinin. So we, do we understand why in its um, pre-fusion form it doesn't randomly uh, fuse with membranes because the, the ends haven't been flayed out? Is that, is that the idea? No, I don't think it would fuse with the membrane because, in fact, most of the fusion peptide is buried behind itself. It's wrapped around itself. There's an extended chain, a small beta strand, and an alpha helix that's buried, so it couldn't possibly interact with membranes. And the, and the trigger for this exposure? We believe comes from the, the HN protein binding silic acid, and we have, more, we have three different structures of the hemagglutinin neuraminidase with the heads in different positions, and we think that's part of the activating process. Okay, so what, what's one of the big unanswered questions? how it really works. <laughs> <laughs> how the whole thing works. How, how the whole machine works and becomes activated. And then, in fact, what's the process? The, what are the intermediates in the F-protein during this massive refolding event? It's the largest refolding event known for any viral protein that uh, causes membrane fusion. And we have to remember that the catalog of, few, of proteins that fold into a metastable form is extremely small. It's basically the viral proteins and then the serpin proteases and a few others. But there's not much else we know about in biology at the present time that has these types of change. So after all, everybody was taught in high school that the amino acid sequence of a protein defines their structure. And indeed, there are people like David Baker who are in Seattle who are extremely good now at predicting the, the atomic structure of proteins under 30,000 or so. And they have a competition every year to predict that. And they're getting very good at that. But as I said to David Baker not so long ago, your ultimate challenge will be to be able to predict the two completely different conformations that the fusion proteins adopt. And he just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> So are you going to uh, figure out how it works? Is that one of the things, your, your goal, one of the goals of your lab? That's one of the goals, and we hope to be able to do it sooner than later. All right. Well, good luck. Um, Greg, I know that from, as you, you came from the Enquist lab, so you must work on pseudorabies virus, right? Yeah. Many people don't even know what that is. But What is pseudorabies virus? Pseudorabi pseudorabies is, first of all, it has nothing to do with rabies virus. It's a, belongs to a different family. It is, in fact, a herpes virus. It's an alpha herpes virus, and like most alpha herpes viruses, it's a neuroinvasive pathogen. Uh, it's highly virulent. So it's, I think Lynn started working on it for a number of reasons, but it's a model of herpes simplex virus infections in humans, which causes cold sores as the most common outcome. But uh, it's, it's much more virulent in, in its hosts. It does not infect humans, uh, and it's highly neuroinvasive. It's probably the most neuroinvasive uh, pathogen known. I think it's fair to say. And, uh, and so it's, it's a wonderful model if you just want to understand these more rare forms of disease that can occur with human herpes viruses in humans. Uh, some people will get a sporadic form of encephalitis, which is uh, life-threatening. And, uh, and you can't really model that easily. Uh, but with pseudorabies virus in its natural hosts or in other animal models that become naturally infected, although they are dead-end hosts in nature, these outcomes become very frequent if not default. And so it gives you an opportunity to study these processes. So once uh, we, we asked Lynn for some virus, pseudorabies virus, I don't remember what we were doing. And he's, he wrote me a note and explained, you know, how to grow it and titrate it. And then he said, be careful, you may fall in love with this virus. <laughs> and I don't know if, there's, if, I, if I'm that loving of the virus, but I do, I do like it very much. So one of the things I recall from what Lynn does is he labels the virions or the viruses with various fluorescent proteins and uses them to trace where the virus is. Did you do that in, in his lab as yeah, well? Yeah, we started doing that when I was a postdoc with, with Lynn. Uh, at the time, people were making recombinant viruses using a technique where they would take a recombinant allele that they made and they would transfect it into mammalian cells uh, and have the virus replicate in those cells and hope that you get a homologous recombination it was a not a very effective process, and uh, GFP came onto this. A green fluorescent protein came onto the scientific scene, and that helped people make recombinant viruses because now you could actually look at the plaques that the virus produced and, and with a fluorescent microscope see that the plaques are green and find your recombinant much more easily than before. And we took it a stage further and made infectious clones, uh, which I know you have a bit of a history in as well, 
uh, I mean, infectious clones of the herpes viruses, and uh, well, pseudo rabies virus in particular. And, uh, and using that, we were able to use uh, GFP much more effectively to make very common viruses, including ones that made translational fusions. Uh, and these allowed us to image the viral particles inside living cells and see the dynamics of infection. So in that case, the, the fluorescent protein is fused to some protein that's in the particle itself. That's right. And so the first ones that we were interested in were fusing to the capsid core. So as, you, as many of your listeners will know, the herpes virus structures for a virus is somewhat complex. It has a, a cosahedral capsid core, uh, and surrounding that is a layer of additional viral, viral protein collectively called tegament, and then around that is the envelope with its transmembrane glycoproteins and other assorted protein. And so uh, the first structural element that we wanted to fuse was the internal capsid, a cosahedron, because that's the marker of where the genetic information is inside a cell during infection. And we, ultimately, we wanted to know where was, how was the, the, the genetic information being delivered to the nucleus and how is it being packaged late in infection to leave the cell. So when you came here, you clearly brought the virus, the technology, and probably some specific viruses you had constructed with you, I assume. Yes. Right? So this is always an interesting question going from a postdoc to your own lab. What can you bring and what can't you bring? And did, for you, was it a straightforward process? You know, Lynn is a very generous individual. And uh, he basically let me do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, he also, when I talked to him about my interests and what I wanted to pursue, uh, he was happy to back off from that for the short term and let me run with it. And uh, since that time, he's, we've gotten, you know, something, there have been a few little things where we've gotten closer together again, but for the most part, he's moved his way and I've gone off on, on mine. And, uh, and he's always been extremely supportive about the whole situation. So I was very fortunate to have an advisor that was very, very giving. It's important to point out that that's not an assumption. Many cases, no. <laughs> advisors don't want you to take anything with you. It, it, it varies. You know, it goes all across the goes gamut. Both spectra, yeah. So um, when, you, when you set up your own lab, you obviously had questions that were extensions of what you were doing, but you also came up with your own ideas as well. Yes. So, so now how do you distinguish yourself from, from that? What's, what's unique to the Greg Smith lab? Well, my, 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 I think my, my primary interest in general is neuroinvasion, viral neuroinvasion. So that, that's, before you go on, what do you, what do you define as neuroinvasion? <laughs> that's a good question because Lynn and I have actually argued that term a little bit. Neuroinvasion to, to Lynn means that the virus is getting into the CNS. Okay, no matter where you put it in the animal, it gets in the CNS. Well, I suppose if you did this experiment that Bob was talking about in putting strange intracranial injections of a virus, I don't know if that would count as neuroinvasion. But, uh, but certainly if you put it at a peripheral site, if it can then transmit into the central nervous system, spinal cord, or the brain, then that's his definition of neuroinvasion. I, I look at it more broadly, and neuro mean neuron. I, I, I consider that if the virus can get into the peripheral nervous system, that's also a form of neuroinvasion. Uh, and so I, I, I guess I use the term a little bit more loosely than he does. So you're interested in how that works for pseudorabies virus? You know, for the neuroinvasive herpes viruses in general, but also even beyond that. I mean, polio as well is something that I'm very intrigued by. I mean, there's some interesting comparisons that could be made between the viruses, actually. I think we corresponded years ago about this, in fact, the retro different kinds of transport in, in nerves of polio versus uh, the herpes viruses. Well, so polio, I'm, I, polio I, I'm very intrigued by in the sense that, you know, as, as of course m many people know, polio, bef prior to the Sabin and Salk vaccines, was, you know, it's, it's a borderline neuropathogen in, in the sense that most people who get infected by polio never get neuroinvasion. It's probably about 1%, I think, was the estimates. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that because it was it's so prevalent that there were so many people that had the, the paralytic infection. But uh, it, it is a very infrequent neuroinvasive pathogen, whereas the herpes viruses that are neuroinvasive basically do it by default. So it's, for all intents and purposes, it's about 100% it's 100 neuroinvasion. And, uh, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the papers that I had been thinking about a lot recently while I was writing a review article was um, some work that came from Julie Pfeiffer at UT Southwestern. And she uh, showed that, so with polio, of course, you can get this provocation effect where if you do muscle damage, uh, the virus is more prone to become neuroinvasive in that host. And this was very important when it came to giving vaccines. You don't want to give a polio vaccine while you're giving other vaccines in muscle. And she, using that, that knowledge, she realized that if you go ahead and use animal models, an animal model that we talked about today, actually, uh, you could get the virus in more easily. And so it seems with, into the nervous system. So it seems with polio, there is an innate barrier, probably not just polio for any, there's an innate barrier between the periphery 
and the, nervous, and the peripheral nervous system. There's something about that that viruses can't cross very easily. They can't cross that threshold. And with polio, you need to do some kind of damage, apparently, to make that threshold more uh, easily across. With herpes, they, they don't have a problem. And we, we published a couple years ago a phenotype that I think relates to all this, where if you mutate an enzymatic activity in the herpes viruses, uh, a protease, that cleaves them ubiquitin off of proteins. So it's a deubiquitinase, or dub, that you get basically the polio phenotype. So the virus now does not transmit, in, for PRV, it does not transmit into the nervous system, but it replicates very well on peripheral uh, cells that are innervated by the nervous system. Uh, and we thought at f first the phenotype was very dramatic. It just lost neuroinvasion, and we were very excited by that because it was a novel phenotype. But we realized that sometimes it would get in in one animal. And it looked like that the correlation was, was who was doing the injection and how well they injected virus in the, the peripheral tissue. And if they did it kind of sloppily, the virus would get into the nervous system. So it seemed like it related that if you did extensive damage at the periphery, the virus now is neuroinvasive, very much like polio is by yeah, default. Right, right, and so right. I think it all ties into this thing that there may be an innate barrier to infection. And some viruses have figured out how to cross it efficiently and other ones don't. And the ones that don't probably don't really need to to be productive. So do you know what the deubiquitinase is actually doing? Uh, no. So Nick Huffmaster is a graduate in the lab whose project involves in this and we are looking We've identified a number of substrates inside cells that of, of this activity, and there's a lot of work ahead of us to figure out which ones are relevant. So the observation with polio is this Julie found that she, her idea is that the axonal transport is very slow, and you need to speed it up by damaging the muscle, and in that case, polio gets in more efficiently. That's right. But maybe herpes is doing something to speed up transport? It does something instead of tissue damage. It has another yeah. way to do it, perhaps. So yeah. a good experiment to do yeah. would be to mix polio and a herpes virus together and do your neuroinvasive experiment. Or put the dub into polio yeah, if, if into you want polio. to risk it. Yeah, yeah. because <laughs> then um, whatever herpes virus is doing, it should allow polio. It should complement the defect that polio is encountering. Right, and right? we did show that, that that works when you take a, a wild-type herpes and a mutant herpes, that they, right. they complement in trans so in that if, regard. If you, It'd be very interesting to say polio does We can send thing. you some polio if you want to do that. <laughs> no, we could talk. It's good that. that. That would be cool to do. Um, anything else before we, we move on that you want to mention that's, that's interesting? Uh, well, we're, I mean, we've always been very interested in the cell bi neuro cell biology that, that underlies how viruses move inside cells, in particular, in this case, in axons or these long distances. Yeah, and, they're particularly uh, long, so that, that's an interesting question, not like a little cell that... Right, and, and many viruses have to be able to move, uh, have facilitated movement inside a cell to get to the site of replication and to come back out of the cell. Uh, some I mean, in the case of polio, you're, you're essentially just injecting a, me a messenger RNA that ribosomes can latch onto and go right away. But certainly for herpes simplex and many other viruses, if you replicate in the nucleus, you definitely have to be able to translocate long distances. The cytoplasm is a very viscous place, and large viral partic par particles cannot easily diffuse through that passively. So understanding how those mechanisms actually, how the viruses subvert cellular machinery that were there to do something else, I think is a fascinating question uh, with lots of implications. And it's interesting that it's been so hard to address for, I think, any aspect of virology, any of studying viruses in this question. It's been very hard to understand how these interactions work and they're regulated. And so we're, pu we're putting a lot of time and effort trying to understand how that works in the case of pseudorabies virus and herpes simplex virus. So using fluorescently marked virions are important for this kind of, of work, right? Because you can visually track as viruses. You can actually move. watch them marching down by, by, by uh, time-lapse microscopy. It's, it's a very cool thing to see if, no one's, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, I get joked about a lot of times that we just look at dots because the, the viruses are so small that all you're seeing is a, a spot of fluorescent diffraction fluorescence coming from wherever they are. But nevertheless, the dynamics of those dots is, is quite impressive. And, uh, and in the case of the herpes viruses, you can get hundreds of events over a very short time frame. We often refer to in the lab as this particles raining into the cell nucleus. And uh, it's amazing how effective they are. And other viruses don't seem to be quite as effective. So herpes viruses, perhaps because they have so much genetic capacity, have probably evolved more specific mechanisms to make this process very efficient, which is necessary also for their neuroinvasiveness. So when you do these imaging studies, what are you, what are you, are you looking at? Explants, some kind of culture? What, what is the substrate for it? There's a couple ways you can do it, but what we do most typically in the laboratory is we culture out primary neurons, sensory neurons. From rats? We, well, we actually use for our day-to-day -day stuff, we use uh, avian. And the reason, so with chicken, you, you can get from any kind of farm you, that, that has chickens, you can get fertilized eggs. And uh, you can just incubate those. 
Yeah, you've heard about this. No, it's very difficult to get fertilized eggs though these days. The number of people that are prepared to sell them has declined dramatically because of all the virus, all the eggs are going to the people who make influenza virus vaccine. So our local producer just cut us off. And they now want four dollars an egg. Oh, well, I can tell so you who we're you using. Need to go with you. I need to know what you're using. <laughs> I can set you up if you want. Okay. We actually use the same one as the museum does. So, but uh, anyway, for the for the hatchery. But uh, yeah, so we just do that. And that way, the nice thing about that is, uh, you know, getting neurons is is kind of primary neurons from a, from an animals is a is tricky business, and uh, it also is time consuming. It's expensive, but if you just get an egg. You know, you can have them constantly incubating in an egg incubator that just takes up a very small amount of space. You can have them in there, you know, every day. Have them get to about nine days when they've developed to the point where you have tissue that you can dissect out. And you can have neurons ready to go within a couple of days to do an experiment any day of the week. Um, you would never be able to achieve that kind of throughput using mammalian systems. So we, that's what we do by our default. And when we get a result that's really interesting to us, then we repeat the experiments in a mammalian system to make sure it's consistent. And pseudo rabies will infect these avian. It loves them. It loves and, them. And the other terribly important thing about using chick, chick embryos is, is that you don't have to have animal forms. You do not need to have animal forms. That's absolutely right. Is that right? No. Yes. Because they're not, they're not, not, as long as they're not hatched. As long as they don't hatch. Yeah. If they hatch, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One, because they think that you're their mother, and, and, then, and then they have to kill them when they're like, say, mom, mom, mom. I mean, it's not, not a pleasant but, thing uh, to do. Uh, uh, you do not need animal forms for, uh, for chicken, embryonated chickens. Well, when I, when I worked on flu as a graduate student, uh, we used to have them hatch all the time, but at the time there was no ayakuk, and we didn't need forms for anything. So what did you do with them? Pets? Uh, we had a guy who would take them home and raise them and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can recommend that to well, my students. That, that's, that's a passport to jail these days. <laughs> these days, yeah. It's a long time ago. A long time. No, we would sack them, typically. Um, but they would often hatch because you wouldn't use some and you leave them in the warm room, you forget. You forget, yes. All right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not a good thing anymore. Uh, Andrew, let's, let's hear a little bit about uh, what you're doing. Can you talk about... Sure, yeah. Um, so in the Long Acker lab, we also study herpes viruses. Um, part of the lab studies Epstein-Barr virus, and another part of the lab studies herpes simplex virus type 1 and herpes simplex virus type 2. Um, and I work on herpes simplex virus and are particularly interested in how the receptors uh, mediate pathogenesis of the virus. And I uh, study um, how the virus uses those, re those receptors in an ocular model of infection in mice. And so um, herpes simplex virus entry is pretty complicated, and I'm sure Sarah can uh, tell you more details about the actual machinery and the proteins that are doing it, but the, the virus requires uh, several glycoproteins to mediate entry, um, and it has several different receptors that it can use to enter cells, um, and several of them were discovered here at uh, Northwestern by Pat Spear before she uh, retired, and actually I think you were on one of the a co-author on one of the papers where they discovered that nectin-1, which is one of the entry receptors, uh, is used by the virus. And so that we have these knockout mice uh, for the receptors. So we have wild-type uh, C57 black 6 mice that have uh, both HVEM, which is one of the receptors, stands for herpes viral entry mediator, so it's well named for what it does for our purposes. Uh, and then nectin-1 is the, is the other receptor that we're interested in. And then we have uh, HVM knockout mice and nectin-1 knockout mice and then double knockout mice. And uh, before I joined the lab, um, there were some studies done with HSV-2 using these mice in an intravaginal model and a direct cranial in injection model. And both those studies showed that um, you didn't really need HVM, that the wild-type mice and the HVM knockout mice both got sick, uh, both developed symptoms of of uh, herpes and uh, both succumb to the infection ultimately. And that the infection was attenuated in nectin-1 knockout mice and that if you had, if you lacked both receptors in the double knockout mice, you couldn't infect the mice at all. So we wondered if uh, the, both of these receptors, if we, if we would see the same phenotype in an ocular model using HSV-1 and uh, actually we found something a little different which is that if you knock out either HVEM or nectin-1, you get an attenuated infection in the eye. So it appears that with HSV-1, you need uh, both HVM and nectin-1 to cause sort of a, a wild-type disease or wild-type pathogenesis, which was, uh, which was new and interesting. And so we've been following that up with uh, studies in HSV-2 in the eye, too, to see if the differences between the two serotypes of the virus or if it's um, something unique to the eye. 
So is that because the the receptors are somewhat redundant? If you take uh, one away, the other can be used, and so so but not both. N not, necess not necessarily because if you take HFEM away, at least in the previous experiments in the, in the vaginal model and the cranial model, um, the virus can use nectin just fine and doesn't seem to mind the fact that HFEM is not there. Um, in the eye, as I, as I said, it's a little different where it seems that uh, the virus some, for some reason needs both receptors even though it only binds to one receptor at a time. Um, a possible explanation for that is that HFEM, after it was discovered uh, as a, a herpes uh, entry receptor, has subsequently been shown to be important in regulating the immune system. It has both uh, immune stimulatory and immune inhibitory effects depending on which other uh, partners it's binding to and what cells it's expressed on. So uh, one hypothesis that we're kind of working on is that perhaps the virus has evolved to, to target HFEM to modulate the immune system in its favor and that this modulation is uh, more important in an eye infection than um, in, in another route. Is that something you're going to look into? Yeah, that's, that's uh, the, the next direction. We're trying to work on making viruses that uh, can differentially bind to the two receptors so that we can investigate it both from the receptor being absent in the animal but also the virus not being able to uh, engage one of those receptors. Do you ever think about using uh, some of Greg's viruses? fluorescently labeled viruses in this? We, uh, like we, we have uh, uh, collaborated some with, uh, with Greg's lab and used uh, some of those fluorescently labeled viruses to, to take a look at where the virus is in the eye and how it's infecting it. Um, and uh, I know that uh, if, if you know, we need to make other mutations, they're a great resource to have just a few floors down to help us do that because they're a mutant viral factory. <laughs> So what stage are you? How much more time in the lab do you have? So I'm just about to finish up my third year um, of the PhD part of my training. And uh, hopefully by this time next year, I'll be finishing up my PhD and heading back uh, to finish the third and fourth years of medical school, which are the, the clinical years. So I'll be doing uh, clinical rotations in the hospital and, and seeing patients and seeing a little bit more what it's like to be a, a practicing physician. Does that sound good, Richard? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rich, Rich is... Um, yeah, Rich has been really uh, supportive in, in uh, me taking on this project because this was uh, using the eye model was something that the lab hadn't really done uh, before it came along, but uh, he was really supportive in helping me get it started. And um, there's a technician in our lab, uh, Sarah Kopp, who uh, basically taught me everything I know and has been... Um, a really good teacher and, and, and lab partner to, to have uh, in these experiments. So when you finish your, um, your late, late, later clinical years, what do you do next? Do you do a postdoc, a fellowship? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so um, uh, after you graduate with an MD, PhD, people can kind of go in different directions. There are some people that decide at that point that uh, you know, medicine's not really for them. They really want to just get right back into the lab and they go and do uh, sort of a traditional postdoc. Uh, for me, I, I definitely uh, do want to see patients, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a residency program and then a uh, fellowship after that, and then uh, hopefully someone will hire me to uh, be a physician scientist at a university. Well, after they hear you on TWIV, they will. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of the TWIV bump. I have, I have. I'm hoping it, uh, it applies in this case. You're going to get it, no problem, yeah. So whoever's listening, you know, there you go. But it'll be a few years yet before yeah. you're ready. It's, I mean, it's been a long haul, but uh, I've really, really enjoyed um, my time in the MSTP here and uh, uh, really enjoyed all the, um, my fellow students and people in the, in the program, and um, it's, been a, it's been a great experience so far. All right. Uh, Sarah, tell us what you're doing. I study herpes virus entry into cells, also in Rich Longnecker's lab with Andrew, and I give him practice in being a doctor by coming to him for his <laughs> advice on various afflictions, like I had hand, foot, and mouth disease a couple of weeks ago. So, um, you isolate virus? Uh, no, I considered it, because <laughs> adults really aren't supposed to get that. Um, but it's a picornavirus, right? Uh, Coxsackie. Well, that's a picornavirus. Right? Well, Okay. <laughs> Um, so right, I'm not studying that virus now, I'm studying herpes simplex virus. Um, and so I said previously that I was a postdoc in Bob's lab studying virus entry with paramyxovirus, studying the fusion protein that he was talking about. And um, crystal structures of the fusion protein from herpes simplex virus uh, were published. And that's attra attracted me back into herpes uh, entry 
research. Um, so herpes simplex virus and the other herpes viruses have a more complex entry mechanism than many other viruses. Um, lots of viruses, I think as Bob said, use a single protein to bind a receptor and then trigger fusion. Uh, paramyxoviruses and herpes viruses encode their receptor binding protein and their fusion protein. Well, their receptor binding activity and their fusion activity are encoded in two different proteins. Um, actually, in the case of herpes simplex virus, there's four proteins required. So you have a protein that binds to a receptor, and then you have a protein that mediates fusion of the virus with the cell, and then you have two other proteins which um, are likely involved in communicating between the other two glycoproteins. So you've got to bind receptor, communicate with another, another glycoprotein, and then communicate with the fusion protein. And is this also low pH dependent fusion? No, it depends on the cell type. With uh, HSV, some cells you will get low pH uh, dependent fusion, but some cells you fuse on the plasma membrane. Um, and we don't, I don't think, know really why that is. Um, but then when, once you've triggered the fusion protein, you need to convert from a pre-fusion form to a post-fusion form. And the crystal structures that are, have been published are both post-fusion forms. So the glycoprotein that's the fusion protein is called glycoprotein B, so GB, um, and it's conserved among all herpes viruses. So we've got herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, which cause cold sores and genital herpes, and you've got chickenpox, VZV, um, you've got cytomegalovirus, Kaposi sarco sarcoma herpes virus. Um, so a lot of viruses where this is an important protein, and it's conserved, and this is why I'm interested in studying it. Um, in Bob's lab, the protein he, the fusion protein that I studied in his lab is a class one fusion protein. He, as he said, he has the crystal structure of pre-fusion form of that protein as well as post-fusion form. Um, and in having those two structures, you can put together a model of how the protein is refolding, and then you can test that model. For glycoprotein B in herpes viruses, we only have the post-fusion form. And so right now what I'm interested in learning is uh, what the pre-fusion form might look like and how it transitions from the pre-fusion to the post-fusion form. Um, this is interesting to me in a, just a basic biochemistry, um, as a basic biochemistry question, how is this protein refolding from a pre-fusion to a post-fusion form to drive the fusion of the virus with the cell? Um, but it's also potentially clinically relevant um, if you can learn how the protein is uh, transitioning from pre-fusion to post-fusion, you may be able to develop things that can inhibit that transition, and thus this would be a good antiviral against um, the variety of herpes viruses that I've mentioned. Um, so uh, class one fusion proteins, like the paramyxovirus fusion protein that Bob was talking about, have the, this structure called a six helix bundle, which um, is very energetically stable, and it's thought to the formation of the six helix bundle in the post-fusion form is thought to provide the energy for the transition from the, well, the energy to drive fusion of the virus with the cell. Um, glycoprotein B from herpes viruses, uh, in the structure, it's not a class one fusion protein, but it has a region in it that looks similar to the six helix bundle that's present in the class one fusion proteins. And so, most recently, I've been looking at that region of the protein to try to determine if. Uh, class 3, which is what glycoprotein B is a class 3 fusion protein, whether class 3 fusion proteins refold through a similar process as class 1 fusion proteins. So when you say you're looking at, what, yeah. what kinds of experiments? Are you doing mutagenesis, biochemistry, structural determination, all so of the above? So I've tried a few approaches. I, I tried to use some peptides that might inhibit the formation of this uh, structure. Those didn't work for me. Um, so I did it by mutagenesis, and I uh, made some mutations in the GB protein, which would be predicted to lower the strength of the interaction of two regions of the protein. Um, and the result is that when you make mutations in that region, you get a, a reduction in the level of fusion, which I believe may be because we've trapped the protein in a pre-fusion conformation, or at least uh, reduced the frequency at which it converts to a post-fusion form. So when you go to DePaul, is that yes, where you're going? Yes, DePaul. Are you taking some of this with you? Yeah, Rich Longnecker has been very supportive, as we've been saying is important. Um, I'd like to continue a collaboration with him. I'm only going to be, I, what is it, two miles away. So I'm hoping to um, have a productive collaboration. I'd like to come back down here. I'm going to be the only virologist on campus up there, so it would be nice to have some people here to talk to about my work. Um, but yeah, I will be continuing working on herpes simplex virus uh, entry into cells. And when are you moving? September 1. Good yeah. luck with that. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to read a couple of emails because this is an important part of TWIV, and there is one coming up that we need you to answer. 
all right, because it has to do with flu. So stay awake, okay? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm asleep. All right, the first one is from Kate, who uh, writes, Dear Team Twiv, thanks for all the wonderful podcasts over the years. It's been great to regularly tune in to a more relaxed forum of academic discussion throughout my years of virology study. So you see, we're very relaxed <laughs> here in Twiv. I'm in the final year of my PhD at the University of Cambridge and the Un Institute of Zoology. Weren't you at Cambridge? I was at Cambridge, uh, yes. I remember that. I was in pathology there. And my PhD research has centered on the risk of viral zoonotic disease emerging from a fruit bat population in Ghana, West Africa. I really enjoyed the most recent TWIV episode, 183, that covered Jan Drexler's paper about bats as reservoirs of major mammalian paramyxoviruses. Have you seen this paper? Yes, I have. Fabulous. Fabulous. It's amazing, paper. yes. That said, we, of though... Of course, we don't know they're all viruses yet. They're just sequences. Absolutely. Mostly. Yes, we did point but that out. But I presume they're viruses. Some of them, they had full-length genome right. sequences. And they will only be entered into the databases, at least for ICTV, when they have full-length full sequences. Yeah. Uh, there were a number of comments made on the show about a number of firsts in this paper, e.g. first specific study of paramyxoviruses in bats, first evidence of virus closely related with mumps in an animal host, etc., that weren't correct. I published an admittedly much smaller study in the Journal of General Virology earlier this year showing that bats host a large diversity of paramyxoviruses, including a virus closely related with mumps, C attached. <laughs> Just trying to keep you on your toes, and thanks again for all the good podcasts. So, you know, science is self-correcting, so is TWIV. It gets corrected. <laughs> so she's right. We just said, hey, is the first report, and everyone said yes, and so that, that happened. So thanks for correcting that, Kate. And good luck with those fruit bats. All right, this is... Um, so what's the question for me about fruit bats? No, no, no the, next one is, the next one is for you. <laughs> Stephen writes, hey, Twiv dudes, um, let me say, great podcast. You're truly doing a service to the field and to society. Let me get right into it. I'm a graduate student in virology at the University of Rochester. I work with influenza, and I just saw a great seminar this morning about gathering information from clinical epidemiological studies after they've already been completed. It got me thinking of an interesting set of data that may or may not exist out there as of yet. Are the severe hospitalized cases of H5N1 at all correlative to previous vaccination? In other words, of the 600 or so reported cases, did those individuals ever receive a flu shot? Did those who did, who died, have a higher or lower incidence of previous vaccination? Could be an interesting question. Just thought I'd throw it out there. Back to my experiments. <laughs> you have any idea whether? Well, I mean, I would make a guess. I have no idea. Now, I have no facts whatsoever, but I would make a guess. If you think where, in fact, those cases of H5N1 that have killed people have been, which is Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Egypt, I very much doubt if they've been vaccinated for influenza. I think vaccination for influenza up to now has been a European and Western uh, thing and not one that belongs to developing countries. So, so I guess it's not. I would imagine, though, what he was really alluding to is this new phenomenon of trying to find uh, antibodies uh, that are broadly neutralizing. I imagine that's what it was at the back of his mind when he asked that question. Yeah. yeah. So again, if anyone knows better who's listening, let us know. But that, that's what I thought also. These individuals, by the way, who die of severe H5 infection, they re we really should study their, their genome because I'll bet they have mutations. You know, for, for severe herpes simplex encephalitis, there are specific mutations in innate immune proteins that confer that. And I'll bet it's the same with severe flu. In fact, there is one mutation, IFIT IFITM3. Which confers severe flu, right? It's uh, associated with severe which flu. Which is associated with it. There's, so there's this correlative study yeah. from, the, from done from Britain right. uh, that w would imply that, yes. So I'll bet these individuals have a problem as well. May possibly, but we don't know what's in. Um, so that's an in interferon-induced protein. Right. All right, let's do one more. This is from Don. Greetings, my virome idols. You get that, idols? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a registered nurse with nearly 20 years in the emergency department, as well as an Army Reserve Nurse Corps officer. 
and have been a loyal listener since your team began producing TWIV. Your podcast has been a vital resource for me in both my professional realms and better preparing me for frontline uh, ED nursing as well as my military duties in the Asia Pacific region. Till now, I have not felt the need to email a question to such an esteemed group as yours, that is, until this week, and I hope you can answer these concerns. I'm always amazed to hear who is listening, right? This is just amazing. As background, I currently work as civilian staff nurse in a large military medical center's emergency department, and we were notified about a few cases of influenza not covered by the current vaccine from troops returning from Japan. All reported cases have generally been mild, lasting less than a week, and present with a febrile respiratory symptom, not unlike any influenza-like illness that we have seen in the ED on a daily, nightly basis. The only difference is, if the history includes recent travel from Japan and or participation in the exercise in Japan over this last month. If the history does include the Japan travel and have ILI, influenza-like illness symptoms, we are instructed by our infection control department to mask the patient and segregate from the general ED waiting population, especially infants, children, pregnant women, and elderly patients. These patients are to be evaluated as any other ILI patient to include swabs for influenza virus screening and treated as would other suspected influenza patients. Also, we were instructed that Tamiflu was to be used in severe cases. Our other duty in this area is to maintain a log of these patients that present to our ED and forward it to infection control and the command suite as part of the daily report to the hospital commander. To date, I am only personally aware of two cases. My questions are, are you or any of you aware of an influenza virus from Japan that is not covered by the current seasonal vaccination and do you feel this represents a risk? Our measures are not different than what we did during the H1N1 outbreak and seem reasonable. Most of our patients are active duty military and are reliable to follow instructions and comply with masking and segregation. My question here is, are these measures sufficient? Since all staff are required to have been vaccinated with seasonal flu vaccine on an annual basis as a condition of employment, how much risk does the staff have from potential infected patients? And is there a number of cases seen before we raise our level of PPE use, N95 masks? And one last question that I have always wanted to ask the TWIV Lords. After 20 years of ED nursing, I have been hit with, splashed on, and exposed to more bugs than I can ever care to recall and yet I have nev not suffered any illness that I could remotely link to work exposure. I rarely get a cold and I don't recall any ILI in years. Has my immune system developed to such a state from repeated exposure in the ED or is it just my nature? <laughs> Thanks for the podcast. I greatly enjoy the weekly banter, especially the witty quips from Dr. Dove. Well, there you go, Alan. You know anything about a flu in- I, I haven't heard about a new flu from Japan. Uh, but to the bulk of his question, uh, is he doing things right? The answer is yes. He's, everything's been done correctly, the, the right things to do. If it was a completely immunologically new hemagglutinin or new, neuraminidase, uh, there isn't a vaccine for that, then he's doing the best that can be done under the circumstances. As for his own personal situation, I mean, the people that get the sickest usually from multiple uh, colds and sniffles and other respiratory viruses are school teachers who teach four to five year olds. Kindergarten teachers are exposed to everything and they do get sick. So whether he's had such exposure or whether he's just lucky, I don't know. Sequence his genome. <laughs> yeah, I think he's got a great immune system. It's perfect. And, uh, you know, you can, you know, in families, you have a couple of kids, one always gets sick, the other doesn't. I bet they have some, some differences in innate uh, sensors or something like that. Um, do we, we have an ID guy here. Does this sound good? They're doing the right thing with the masks and so forth? And yeah, that's it's okay. They should be doing that with seasonal. Yeah. That's right. But the real difficulty is he said everybody in the military is vaccinated against influenza virus. It's the military, I'm so sure it's true. They're told to line up and it's you, 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 you as you go down the line. The one of the real problems is, is if it's mandatory theoretically for hospital staff at every hospital, near, I think, in this country. But compliance is terrible. I mean, nurses and doctors simply say, I don't get sick which is absolutely nonsense. I mean, we witnessed that with the 2009 pandemic. So uh, I, I don't know how the hospitals can enforce their own 
rules? So this is an interesting question. There is another podcast, um, some of you might know, by a ID physician, Mark Chrislip. It's called, it's called The Puscast. You've listened to that, Andrew. Right? Yeah, I listened to uh, The Puscast. So he's always railing about infection control and, and how you should have regulations, and if they don't follow them, get rid of yeah, them. Yeah, he wants to throw people out. <laughs> yeah. He's a little extreme, I think. <laughs> I think he's just concerned for uh, the public's uh, well-being and safety. Yeah, no, I, I mean, he's in a position where he sees things happening and he says, when you do your spinal taps, make sure you wear a mask, because he said a lot of people don't. And they dribble their bacteria into the wound, you know, so people get infections. Okay, let's do a couple of picks of the week. I asked Sarah and Andrew to come up with some, so let's see what Sarah has for us. All right, so my pick of the week is a book. Um, it's written by a journalist, so not a scientist, but a science journalist, and I think she did a reasonable job. And the book is called Breasts, A Natural and Unnatural History, so you don't have to leave the cover on the book while you're on the bus if you're <laughs> a little uh, worried about that. But it's an interesting and amusing book that um, discusses many aspects of the breast. The reason the uh, journalist Florence Williams wrote the book was that while she was nursing her child, uh, she learned about uh, environmental contaminants that were showing up in breast milk and of course this was distressing to her, so she sent her own milk off to get it uh, analyzed and found that there were elements of jet fuel and flame retardants in her milk at normal levels, um, but still, you know, you're breastfeeding your child, you're trying to give them good nutrition, not um, environmental contaminants. Um, so the book is not all a downer. It also talks about um, the positive things in breast milk, and it talks about the anthropological and evolutionary background of breasts, which becomes pretty funny, I think, in the book. And um, also talks about breast cancer and uh, why women, I mean, I have a personal reason for finding the book interesting is because I have a 10-month-old son right now, so uh, um, I'm a little biased perhaps, but the reason mammals are called mammals are because of breasts, so I would advertise that both men and women could find the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Are you worried about the jet fuel? In, in, no, I mean, I'm not going to stop nursing my son, but it is disturbing that, that we have these, uh, and, and babies are really the top of the food chain, um, and, you know, contaminants can be concentrated into high-fat breast milk, so. But probably the benefits outweigh any, any risks, right? Yeah, and, you know, what are you going to do? Like, yeah, you can't live a completely contaminant-free life. No, for sure. All right. Well, thank you for that. Andrew, do you have a pick? So, um, yeah, I actually have two. I don't, I don't know if that's cheating or not. One is uh, a science-related book. Uh, it's called The Strangest Man, The Secret Life of Paul Dirac. It's by Graham Formello. And um, uh, as I mentioned, my undergrad, I was in this uh, integrated science program where I had to take a lot of physics and have a sort of passing interest in theoretical physics. And I, I found the book to be uh, really interesting because Paul, Paul Dirac was a really weird guy, but really, really brilliant. And it's also sort of uh, a history of the development of quantum mechanics and um, how uh, World War II impacted science and impacted uh, the, the field of physics. And then my other pick, uh, real quick, is an uh, app for the iPhone called Stamped. And um, what it allows you to do is you follow people kind of like on Twitter and you uh, put your stamp of approval on things you like. Uh, you know, most people use it for recommending books or um, restaurants or movies to people, but I've started uh, sort of pushing the boundaries of it and I've stamped uh, you know, science podcasts like TWIV or scientific papers I find interesting. Uh, and I think it's a, a really neat way to sort of continue a conversation that's already happening um, it, you know, with friends where you'd say, hey, I just saw this movie, you should really check it out, or I just read this paper, it's, it's really good, and kind of uh, uh, collects that uh, online and makes it easy to, to see and link to. Another way of using social media to do anything, but in particular science and articles and podcasts. That's nice. how I use yeah. it. I think, I think most people probably don't use it that way, but that's, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Stamp. That is a new one to me. Thanks for that. Uh, my pick is a web page of the Gates Foundation, which many people might be interested in. It's called, so the, the Gates does a thing called Grand Challenges in Global Health. They give out grants, um, little starter grants for $100,000, and then if you get good results, you can get phase two for several, up to a million dollars, okay? They have very specific uh, areas. Uh, they have about 15 different areas, including mucosal immunity, uh, mm -hmm. mothers and newborns, um, nutrition, polio eradication, 
uh, it's synthetic biology, tuberculosis, vaccines. So they make a call for proposals, and then when they award them, they're on this page, you can see what's been awarded. So the reason I'm pointing this out, first of all, you might be interested in applying for something, and it's not as hard as you think. Whenever I get the emails for this, I usually put them away because I figure I couldn't come up with something that Gates would like. But if you look at what's been awarded, they're pretty risky, uh, and it's not hard to get one, it seems. Uh, I looked at the polio eradication uh, grants, and many of them are very risky and involve doing work which is all speculative, which is not bad, I think. I think it's good to have that, and the NIH certainly doesn't let us do that. But they're not as hard as you think. So uh, if you want to get, if you have a good idea in these areas and you're looking for $100,000, um, check it out. It's the uh, grand challenges in, in global uh, health. We also have a listener pick of the week from Ed. Um, a couple of visual science type picks for you to follow from Kathy Spindler's, following on Kathy Spindler's pick, uh, which was astronomy photo of the day. The stunning new Pursuit of Light video from NASA. I don't know if you've seen that, but this is really cool. It's a YouTube post. Uh, the MRC biomedical picture of the day, which is a really neat site that I wasn't aware of. A different photo every day, sort of like your astronomy photo of the day, but biomedical science. And he said, I found both of these through following Joe Hansen whose blog is it's okay to be smart.com. <laughs> and he said that's another pick. So Ed is a scientist at the Multiple Sclerosis Research Center in New York City. So that will do it for TWIV 185. You can find this and every other episode on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and also at twiv.tv. We do have an app for your iPhone or Android device. You can get that at microbeworld.org slash app and that'll let you stream the episodes uh, to your phone and do, do send us your questions and comments as usual to twiv at twiv.tv I think our next episode next week will be all email because we have a big backlog of questions I want to thank everyone uh, for participating today Sarah Connolly thank you thank you appreciate it good luck in your your new job thank you very much uh, Andrew thank you for for joining us Thanks for having me, Vince. It's been great. And thanks to both of you for uh, inviting me and organizing the visit here. It was a lot of fun. Greg Smith, thanks for joining us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. It's good to hear about your work, and I'll tell Lynn that it was a lot of fun. I'll tell him to listen, right? There you go. I'm it's sure like he, he will. He told you to listen to his. So I'm sure I'm going to get feedback of what I forgot to say that about his research. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Bob Lamb, who I wanted to get on to him for a long time, and you can see why. <laughs> I'm not you. sure whether that's good or bad. It's good. It's very good. I thought it was really good. And I love the reminiscing about gel, so thank you. But I should have asked you, though, is why does an SDS gel that you run with a trisglycine buffer work? And I'll leave that question open for anybody to tell me the answer at some point. Oh, that's a good one. So we'll throw it out there to the audience. The first answer, the first correct answer, we'll get a TWIV mug. How's that? First correct answer by email, twiv at twiv.tv. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.